Hello, my name is Jim Kuhn with Dasso Aircraft Services. Dasso Aircraft Services is a wholly owned subsidiary of Dasso Falcon Jet, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Dasso Aviation. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, Dasso Aviation manufactures a line of corporate aircraft. Dasso Aircraft Services is the MRO division of Dasso Falcon Jet, and we have major service centers in Wilmington, Delaware, Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where our completion centers, center is, and Reno, Nevada. We also have satellite service centers located in St. Louis, Missouri, and Stewart, Florida. I'd like to thank Concord Battery for allowing us to put on this presentation today for its IA virtual seminar series. Uh, I wanna apologize also, I've been fighting off a little bit of a cold. So if I uh, clear my throat or cough uh, during the presentation, I apologize. I've been fighting it for some time. Can't really wait to do this much longer. So I'm just gonna have to power through it and I apologize. At any rate, I hope everybody gets something out of this presentation. And with that, we'll move forward. Thank you and have a good day. Here's a slide of our agenda of what we plan to go over today. Uh, we're gonna start with doing a overview of some of our legacy aircraft, followed by uh, talking about some of uh, the current production aircraft and one of the aircraft we have that we just announced uh, for future production. Uh, we're also gonna talk about some of our aftermarket solutions we have for uh, some of these aircraft to address obsolescence issues. Uh, we'll start with beginning to talk about the, our Falcon Eye product, followed by uh, high-speed connectivity options. That seems to be a uh, big topic of discussion with a lot of aircraft owners and operators, followed by cabin management system upgrades. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the obsolescence of the Laser Ref 2 and 3, which will be replaced by the Laser Ref 4. And then we'll <clears throat> end with talking about some of the navigation and cockpit upgrade options we have in the Elite 2, our Select 3, the FANS 1A and ATNB solutions for each of those, followed by the Collins ProLine 21 upgrade, the Honeywell EGPWS Smart Runway and Smart Landing System, the Megat ISFD, followed by the Next Gen Radar RDR 7000 and the SAM Standby Indicator. Starting with our legacy aircraft overview, uh, the first aircraft that uh, Dassault produced was the Falcon 20. This was produced in December of 1964. The first business jet developed by the firm, as the first business jet developed by the firm, it became the first of a family of business jets to be produced under the same name. Of these, both of these, both the smaller Falcon 10 and the larger Trijet Falcon 50 were direct derivatives of this Falcon 20. Initially known as the Dassault Mystere 20, approval to proceed with the development of this aircraft was issued during December of 1961. As you can see, it's a low wing monoplane design powered by a pair of rear mounted General Electric CF700 turbofan engines. Uh, <clears throat> later in the development of this aircraft, uh, there were retrofits done uh, on this CF700 and it was replaced with the Honeywell TFE 731 engine. Uh, on May 4th of 1963, the prototype made its maiden flight and the first production aircraft was introduced in December of 1964. Followed by the Falcon 20 was our Falcon 10. This was uh, first launched in December of 1972. After the Falcon 10, came our first trijet aircraft in the Falcon 50, which was first delivered in November of 1976. Then we came out with the wider bodied Falcon 900 in September of 1974. <clears throat> in March of 1973, we introduced the Falcon 2000 aircraft, which uh, filled a niche uh, for twin engine wide bodied aircraft. Now we'll move on to our current production aircraft, starting with the 8X aircraft. The 8X is a three, three engine uh, aircraft that um, seats 12 to 16 passengers. It's powered by three Pratt & Whitney 307D engines 
aircraft has a maximum takeoff weight of 73,000 pounds. The Falcon 7X, which is also a 12 to 16 passenger aircraft, is also powered by three Pratt & Whitney 307A engines uh, that produced uh, 6,400 pounds of thrust each with a maximum takeoff weight of 70,000 pounds. The 6X aircraft, which will be introduced this year, is currently in production, <clears throat> is a twin jet powered by two Pratt & Whitney 812D engines. This aircraft will seat also 12 to 16 passengers with a maximum takeoff range of 77,460 pounds. We also are still producing the 900LX three engine aircraft powered by three Honeywell TFE 731-60 engines with a maximum takeoff weight of 49,000 pounds. And then we have the Falcon 2000 LXS. We also have a derivative of it called the 2000S. The Falcon 2000 has been our best-selling aircraft. It's powered by two Pratt & Whitney 308A engines and it seats <clears throat> 12 to 14 passengers with a maximum takeoff weight of 49,000 pounds. And then this next slide just gives us an overview of the range of all of these aircrafts. And as you, as you can see in the development uh, of the aircraft, the ranges uh, got longer and longer. Uh, our Falcon 6X, uh, which is coming out this year, as I mentioned, will have the largest production uh, cabin uh, for any uh, product, production corporate aircraft with a uh, fuselage diameter of 8.86 feet. And then just recently we announced uh, future production aircraft, the 10X, which will have a mission range of 7,500 nautical miles. This will be by far our largest aircraft that we've ever produced. And it will be powered by a brand new Rolls-Royce uh, two each Pearl 10X uh, engines. Um, we're very proud of this and we look forward to uh, selling many of these aircraft. And that pretty much does it for our legacy production and future production aircraft. As an MRO, <clears throat> we are kind of challenged uh, with making our legacy aircraft relevant. Uh, a lot of these aircraft are planned and developed years before their first flight and they're spec'd out to the latest standard at the time. <clears throat> after, after production, when the aircraft are delivered, these systems become obsolete or unsupported uh, after they are delivered. A lot of these aircraft and the owners expect them to have life of 30 plus years. And with the rapidly advancing technologies as a manufacturer and uh, <clears throat> an MRO of the manufacturer, we're forced to come up with solutions to keep these aircraft relevant. That's gonna be the meat of what we talk about today in this presentation uh, with our Falcon Eye, our cabin connectivity, cabin entertainment, our IRUs, and the cockpit. We'll start by talking about uh, our Falcon Eye product. Uh, this product is currently available on all of our production aircraft. Uh, we came up with a solution for the aftermarket, um, and this is what we're gonna talk about. A little bit about uh, how we got to Falcon Eye. Um, this slide shows you a little bit of the evolution of uh, navigation. It all started with just pure uh, visual flight rules without any gauges. <clears throat> and then it proceeded on to <clears throat> steam gauges or mechanical gauges. And then uh, it, we went into a development of uh, a mixture of uh, CRT and mechanical gauges, which was followed by a uh, total glass cockpit. And then we took that uh, glass cockpit and we moved it into a head-up display. And then from the head-up display, we went to a head-up display and the Falcon Eye. A 
Falcon Eye is currently installed on our Falcon 2000 LXS, Falcon 2000 S, Falcon 900 LX, Falcon 8X, and it's also on the Falcon 7X, which is currently, uh, it's not on this slide. Uh, what the Falcon Eye offers is an unprecedented level of situational awareness. It allows the uh, user to identify, identify runway obstacles like aircraft, fuel trucks, or animals at nighttime. It can virtually see through fog, mist, snow, and other weather conditions in day or night. Uh, it, this, all this information is displayed on the head-up display in addition to the flight data uh, that combines a synthetic terrain mapping and actual thermal low light camera <clears throat> images into a single view on the HUD. Uh, it's driven by a database terrain mapping. Um, it can detect LED runway lighting before the naked eye can even see it. Actual thermal, thermal and low light cameras uh, pick up these, these images. Uh, the cameras, which are, as you can see, are on the front of the aircraft there uh, in our nose cone, uh, display a 30 degree by 40 degree horizontal view, uh, and that's all in uh, high definition. And what this does is it, it gives you a wider field of view, uh, and it doesn't give the user uh, the tunnel, tunnel vision effect that some other HUDs do. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this technology is, is bred from the military aircraft. Uh, that DASO uh, produces. And this slide shows you uh, the installation of the Falcon Eye product. And as you can see, uh, we put an EVS camera inside the nose cone fairing. Uh, the aircraft in the aftermarket does get a new, new, new nose cone capable of housing uh, that camera. <clears throat> And you can see uh, below that uh, where the camera gets mounted under underneath the nose cone. And uh, up in the cockpit, uh, it gets a, a new HUD, new OPU and OCU, and there's modifications done to the actual aircraft structure uh, to uh, accept uh, all of this new equipment. Uh, one thing I think I failed to mention um, on the uh, <clears throat> Falcon Eye was the uh, synthetic terrain mapping that, that is also displayed on the HUD, which uh, becomes very important when an aircraft is flying in, in, into terrain. And this ter the terrain mapping is all database driven, so it's actual terrain mapping. So <clears throat> when a crew is flying into terrain at night, they can actually see the, dis the terrain displayed up, up on the HUD. The next topic we're going to talk about is the need for high-speed connectivity in these aircraft. As you can imagine, <clears throat> the people that fly on these airplanes uh, demand connectivity and they demand faster and faster connectivity. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, as fast as, as this market is uh, advancing, uh, it's a challenge to come up with solutions to meet, to meet these demands. People want the internet on their aircraft to be just as fast as the internet in their house. Uh, this next slide talks about the evolution of connectivity and it's probably a little bit inaccurate in that uh, we should have another block there that says no internet at all. Um, so which kind of came before the, the sat phone. Uh, the sat phone was the next level of communication and then SWIFT 64, which was satellite-based uh, communication, which was 64 kilobits per second, which was very, very slow and very expensive uh, connectivity, followed by SWIFT broadband, which was about 400 kilobits per second, um, followed by the uh, air to ground, the first generation of uh, air to ground uh, communication. Uh, current high-speed connectivity comes in the form of Jetwave, Jetwave KA, which is a Honeywell product, which is a celestial-based uh, um, solution, as well as the uh, Avance L5, which is also provides high-speed connectivity, which is an air-to-ground solution. 
currently we have solutions in high speed connectivity on uh, all of our uh, current production aircraft in addition to the uh, Falcon 900C, EX and uh, Falcon 2000 LXS, LX and S series and all of the Falcon 900s uh, in the form of the Avance L5 air to ground high speed and the JetWave KA high speed. We're currently working with uh, Viasat, who is a, a newcomer into the business and they're growing very, very quickly. Uh, they just ended up buying in Marsat <clears throat> and we're in the process of developing a solution for our uh, 7X, which we hope to have certified uh, by the first quarter of this year. Uh, in addition, SATCOM Direct is coming out with a KA, I'm sorry, a KU solution, which is a little bit slower speed than KA. Uh, and we anticipate having a first quarter certification on the Falcon 2000. And we're in the process of looking for a certification aircraft uh, for the 7X. The Avance L5, a GoGo system, is an air-to-ground system that offers uh, high-speed connectivity. As you can see from the uh, coverage map, <clears throat> this is a domestic-only system that pretty much gives you coverage uh, throughout the United States, up into Alaska and the west coast of Canada and most major uh, cities in, in Canada. Uh, this allows the users about uh, seven megabytes per minute uh, speeds, which is like in-home uh, <clears throat> speeds on the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it is an air to ground system. So it requires that uh, ground stations be set up throughout the uh, continent uh, in order for it to work. As you can see, there's two uh, fuselage based mounted antennas and an LRU that contains uh, the brains of the system uh, plus the uh, router. Like all of our installations, uh, they, have, they undergo uh, pretty stringent substantiation uh, for any installation. Uh, our, being the manufacturer, our engineers are uh, pretty particular about <clears throat> what we install and, and where. Uh, for instance, in this, in our installation, which is uh, certified via STC, uh, <clears throat> the antenna installation has to meet certain aerodynamic load specifications. Uh, it has to be able to withstand uh, fuel tank penetration in the event of a belly up landing. Uh, the antennas have to be able to withstand bird impact uh, it has to be able to uh, meet certain noise impact uh, specifications, and it's got to also comply with the type certificate design of the, of the aircraft. Uh, with our installation, we offer worldwide support, uh, and uh, with the STC comes many, many uh, foreign validations. Um, <clears throat> our installation also uh, allows for future upgrades. This Avance L5 system is currently uh, 4G-like speeds, uh, and the manufacturer, GoGo, is uh, planning to come out with uh, 5G in the next year or so. And this installation allows for uh, future upgrades. Uh, being that it is certified via STC, uh, it also uh, increases the resale value of the aircraft. Uh, with some of the other installations that our engineers have, have seen out there, uh, it doesn't provide any substantiation uh, for the antenna location. Uh, the antenna location has provided interference with some of the other systems on the aircraft, be it uh, communication or other navigation systems. Um, and it also compromises the future, uh, future upgrade path of the, uh, of the system. Uh, so you really have to be careful out there in some of the uh, third party installations. The JetWave KA is our worldwide high speed connectivity uh, solution that we offer uh, on the aircraft you can see listed uh, <clears throat> below. Um, this is a 
tail mounted uh, system, uh, like I said, that does provide worldwide uh, high speed connectivity. <clears throat> Being that it is uh, worldwide high speed, typically it's more expensive than the ground-based system. Um, the uh, most of the legacy aircraft uh, were delivered with Honeywell's MCS um, seventy-one twenty system, which did offer swift broadband service. Uh, with our installation, it requires that that system be taken out uh, because of the size of this antenna, uh, we also have to uh, put a larger uh, radome uh, on top of the on top of the tail. Um, <clears throat> and the existing swift broadband uh, system, if it's removed, uh, you have to uh, typically aircraft uh, uh, per, uh, transmit their uh, fans data link through that old swift broadband system, which requires us to install uh, a new uh, data link unit somewhere mounted on the fuselage uh, that is Iridium based. Uh, once that's removed and the others installed, that would provide you the uh, fans uh, data link that the old MCS 71 system uh, <clears throat> provided. Uh, the MC MCS 8000 system, which is what this KA system is called, uh, operates on the new uh, Inmarsat Jet Connects uh, network. Uh, it's operated uh, with three satellites that cover the entire globe, as you can see uh, in this illustration here. The exception to that are the uh, are the poles, uh, North and South Pole. Uh, so when the aircraft, uh, if an aircraft is going over the top, it may lose connectivity briefly. Uh, it does offer true broadband class connectivity with up to uh, 15 megabit per second uh, data rates, which is uh, in-home experience data rates. And the service is offered through uh, many distribution par partners like uh, Honeywell, SACCOM Direct, Air Inc. Uh, there's a wide variety of service plans that are offered uh, on the KA system. Uh, it's not uh, usually one price suits all, so they have different packages uh, based on the amount of data you're using. <clears throat> Uh, they also offer worldwide support uh, on this system. So if the system goes down somewhere uh, in the world, uh, it does provide uh, worldwide support. Uh, Deso <clears throat> has installed uh, many, many jet wave systems uh, as with the uh, Avance uh, air to ground system. Uh, the substantiation by our engineering is pretty stringent. Uh, being that it's a tail mounted antenna, uh, it is a mass on top of the tail. Uh, it has to meet uh, flutter uh, tail, I'm sorry, uh, has to meet uh, vertical stabilizer flutter requirements by our engineering, as well as weight and balance. Uh, in addition, the KA radome that we do put on top uh, has to meet a certain uh, transmissivity in order to meet the in order to get the speeds that uh, the system uh, transmits. And again, it has to be compliant with the type certificate uh, of the aircraft. Uh, next, we're going to talk about our FCHD, uh, which stands for Falcon Cabin high definition uh, is the Collins venue system that we are putting on our uh, all of our production aircraft. As I mentioned in an earlier slide, uh, these aircraft uh, are developed years and years in advance and they're typically outfitted with equipment that is relevant uh, at the time of development. Uh, it, cab management system is a, is a perfect example uh, of uh, aircraft coming out uh, and soon uh, the system soon being uh, obsolete. <clears throat> Many of our aircraft uh, that are currently uh, flying around have uh, old Audio International in Baker, uh, as well as uh, Falcon Cabin Management System uh, first uh, generation flying around in them that were developed back when, uh, before there was high definition uh, television available. Uh, as everybody knows, uh, standard definition is pretty obsolete now. In addition, 
uh, Audio International and Baker are no longer supporting any of those systems. So uh, owners and operators are forced to either live with the systems they have or uh, upgrade to a high definition system. And uh, typically that is not a very easy process uh, because the entire infrastructure of the old system has to be taken out of the airplane before you can install uh, high definition. Uh, currently <clears throat> our uh, high definition solution, uh, as I mentioned, is the Collins venue system or the FCMS2, FCMS, uh, I'm sorry, FCHD plus system. Some of the features of the FCHD uh, plus system, uh, it's fully supported by the, uh, by the OEM and the help desk solution complying with the forward fit standards, uh, meaning that uh, this is the system that is installed now on all new production aircraft. Uh, it meets the OEM engineering design and quality. It's a very uh, customer centric user interface uh, and it, it enables high definition capability with uh, liquid crystal display monitors and touch touch excuse me touch stream switch controls, uh, audio video on demand meaning there's preloaded content uh, loaded onto the system that's available to the user uh, when they want it. Uh, it also has a, a 3D uh, air show uh, system with it and uh, clearly this addresses the obsolescence of the uh, previous cab management systems installed on the airplane. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, a lot of the Falcons are currently equipped with the obsolete Baker um, <clears throat> FCMS-1 or Audio International systems uh, that are no longer supported and this is just a, a visual uh, of the systems that are currently installed in the aircraft. Uh, our FCMS-1 system, again, discontinued, no longer supported. Parts are mainly not available for many of these uh, systems. Um, <clears throat> so what we go in with uh, back, <clears throat> once we take all the existing switching out, we go back in with the new touchscreen systems that are all installed all along the drink rail. And as you can imagine, there is uh, quite a bit of work involved with removing the old system, uh, not, only all, uh, not only the old wiring, but uh, all these switches uh, have to fit uh, within the drink rail, which usually requires uh, quite a bit of uh, woodwork in order for them to uh, fit properly and nice and flush uh, into the, into the uh, drink rail system. In addition, uh, we inst install a 10.6-inch uh, HTSE uh, multifunction touchscreen uh, in the galley. This is basically the main controls for the system, and it allows the flight attendant or pilots to power up and uh, program uh, the system accordingly. Uh, in addition, up by the HTSE, we install a uh, USB uh, AVOD port and an HDMI aux input. This allows the user to bring on their own content and play it over the uh, newly installed cabin management system. Uh, with the USB port, uh, people can also install Apple TV, Roku, or Fire Stick so they can uh, stream uh, content over the cabin management system. In addition to uh, all the switching uh, that has to be removed, uh, it also requires that old uh, monitors uh, be removed. <clears throat> the old monitors being uh, standard definition will no longer work with the high definition system. Uh, so they have to come out. Typically there is a uh, monitor installed on the aft bulkhead uh, and the forward cabin bulkhead as well. Uh, those come out and they get installed with new uh, high definition monitors, which also require uh, that the uh, bulkhead monitors, uh, or I'm sorry, the bulkheads uh, be reworked um, because they are typically finished uh, with veneer. Uh, 
In addition, the system offers uh, that a uh, iPad or Windows Surface uh, holder mount be installed uh, along the drink rails. Uh, this allows individual users to bring on their own uh, portable device and allows them to view uh, content uh, at their seat. Uh, the system also offers uh, USB power uh, with it at the at the base. And as you can see, it's designed to hold uh, multiple different types of tablets. Uh, Apple <clears throat> uh, iPad with a lightning connector, Apple uh, iPad with a uh, uh, USB Type-C connector, and then we have a universal tablet holder for uh, all other uh, manufacturers. Uh, and uh, in addition, <clears throat> uh, we, we install the USB, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, USB charging ports, uh, which many, many users uh, are demanding nowadays to power their phones, their iPads, uh, or whatever, any other USB powered type device. Uh, so typically when we install uh, the FCHD Plus, we are putting uh, these dual charging ports uh, at each seat location for, so all the users can uh, power their devices. And lastly, as part of the FCH, FCHD Plus system, uh, it includes the, uh, the new air show system, uh, which is a 3D moving map and part of that standard pack package uh, is the worldwide blue marble maps with borders, uh, as you can see uh, <clears throat> above this seat here. Uh, 2D map views, autoplay mode, compass 3D, time zone guide, all the bells and whistles, uh, new generation that uh, the previous air show offered. In addition, uh, they can the user can download an app uh, to their phone and display the air show data on their handheld uh, device. Next item we're gonna talk about <clears throat> is uh, laser rep fours. Uh, again, this is uh, going back to uh, obsolescence. Um, <clears throat> many of the laser rep twos and threes, uh, all of them for that matter, are no longer uh, supported. So what do we mean by laser ref? When we talk about laser ref, we're really referring to the IRUs, the inertial reference units on the airplanes. <clears throat> there are three main components uh, of the IRUs. This basically is the brains uh, of the aircraft. Um, <clears throat> it uses uh, three laser ring gyros to, to measure angular rotation. Uh, so roll, pitch, and yaw. And it also utilizes three accelerometers to measure linear acceleration. The main purpose of the IRUs uh, is it takes uh, data uh, from the air data computer, loads it into the laser ref, and provides the following outputs. Uh, primary attitude in the form of pitch and roll, heading, true magnetic, acceleration, longitudinal, lateral, and normal, <clears throat> angular, ang the angular rates for the pitch, roll, and yaw, inertial velocity, the position, lat, long, and barrow, wind data and calculated speed. So as you can see, the uh, IRU or laser rep is a pretty important uh, piece of equipment for the aircraft. Uh, this shows a, a copy of the MMEL, uh, this one's specific to the Falcon 50, and it shows uh, with your IRS or laser rep, you have to have two uh, to dispatch. Uh, <clears throat> Same with uh, standby magnetic compass. If you lose the magnetic compass, you have to have the two uh, AHARs or IRSs uh, working. And in the case of the Falcon 50, uh, there are, are only two uh, on board. So if one fails, uh, the aircraft cannot dispatch. Uh, standby magnetic compass, if the standby magnetic compass fails, you need two independent custom, uh, compass systems operating in, in order to dispatch which means IRUs, 
Standby Horizon or the Megat ISFD, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, Falcon 900 uh, ha typically has uh, three laser refs installed. If two fail, uh, you cannot dispatch. Uh, so you have to have one. Uh, same with the standby magnetic compass on the 900. If standby magnetic compass fails, uh, you need all three IRUs running. Otherwise, uh, you cannot dispatch. So they came up with the laser ref four. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as I previously mentioned, the twos and threes are now obsolete. There's no more repairs uh, being performed on them and there's no more parts available for them. Uh, with the laser ref four, uh, <clears throat> you get a uh, unit that is 25 pounds lighter, each one than the uh, laser ref two and 10, pound li 10 pounds lighter uh, than the laser ref three. So you can see it's a fairly uh, significant uh, weight savings. Uh, in addition, these units are 30% more uh, reliable uh, with a demonstrated uh, mean time between failure of 30,000 flight hours. Uh, the IRU is an integral system to the airplane and losing it, as we uh, mentioned on the last couple slides, uh, will affect the uh, dispatchability and possibly resulting in an AOG. Uh, so we like to say, if you lose an IRU, uh, it's like having a flat tire. You can't go anywhere until you fix it. Um, <clears throat> the IRUs in the past have been uh, very re reliable, but they're uh, reaching the end of their life, as you can see, is illustrated uh, by the graph below, kind of represents the number of repairs per year. Uh, and, and as you can see here, it's gone up significantly. Next topic of conversation is gonna be uh, navigation options. Uh, with our Falcon 900B, 900C, 900EX, and uh, Falcon 2000 and Falcon 50EX, um, <clears throat> the cockpits uh, are getting a little uh, aged. Um, so we were forced to come out with solutions uh, to meet the uh, demand and needs of uh, current day technology and uh, current uh, requirements with as far as uh, fans um, and uh, ADSB out. So on the uh, Falcon 900C and EX, we came out with uh, the Elite 2 package. <clears throat> what the Elite 2 package did was it upgraded the uh, GPS is in the aircraft uh, to meet uh, the, the WASP uh, requirements. Uh, we also put in new cockpit displays to replace the aging uh, CRT displays that were previously uh, in installed or came with delivery of the aircraft. Uh, the new displays have improved clarity uh, in liquid crystal over the previous uh, CRTs, uh, which helps you know, with crew resource management uh, in addition, the new uh, displays will reduce the cost of ownership uh, through increased reliability and weight reduction. Uh, not sure quite what, what the uh, total weight reduction or savings is uh, from the previous installation, but it's fairly significant uh, weight reduction, which uh, obviously uh, increases your, uh, or reduces your cost of ownership through uh, fuel savings. Uh, they also, <clears throat> uh, provide incre improved situational uh, awareness because of what's displayed on them. Uh, the baseline enhancements on the display, they come with uh, dual JEPs uh, preloaded in them. Uh, they also have the ability to uh, display XM graphical weather and synthetic vision. Uh, and on the right, you can see uh, a display without synthetic vision and then a display after the synthetic uh, vision is installed. And as you can see, it lay, overlays uh, an enhanced moving map of the uh, terrain uh, on the display. Uh, it also provides for uh, aviation in route uh, weather reports as far as terminal area forecast. And all this uh, clearly improves the uh, situational awareness, uh, particularly when you're flying uh, IFR flight rules. 
Uh, same with the uh, 900B, we offer the Select 3, which is the uh, solution uh, that we offer uh, similar to the Elite 2. Um, <clears throat> it gives the user uh, EFIS displays, whereas before it had the uh, old uh, CRT and or uh, depending on the age of the aircraft, the uh, mechanical instrumentation. And as you can see, the uh, EFIS displays uh, give the user the primary and secondary flight data, as well as uh, navigation information. Uh, like the Elite 2, it also comes uh, preloaded with uh, dual uh, Jepson charts, uh, embedded synthetic vision capability, which is an add-on and the standard uh, situational awareness presentation in the form of EGPWS and TCAS. Uh, like the Elite 2, uh, the, the Select 3 also dis displays traffic uh, on the primary flight display along with uh, weather radar and XM weather. And then here's just a list of the, uh, some of the data that is displayed uh, on the multifunction display. And I'll let you, you can just read through that rather than have me talk through it. <clears throat> and then on both the uh, Elite 2 and the Select 3, uh, in order to get to FANS uh, 1A and ATN B1, uh, which is your future air nav over the uh, North Atlantic tracks and uh, future domestic FANS capability, uh, you, the old uh, CDUs, FMS CDUs uh, <clears throat> need to be replaced. Uh, most of our aircraft uh, from the factory, uh, legacy aircraft that is, uh, were delivered with CDU 800s, 810s, or 820s. Uh, again, old, unsupported uh, technology upgraded with new, uh, the new CDU touchscreen uh, display uh, allows for improved cockpit. Uh, aesthetics, eliminates the parallax, uh, parallel, uh, par parallax errors, and it's a more modern and up-to-date technology, uh, increased weight savings, and it's a uh, proven performance in a turbulent environment. Um, it is also a prerequisite to the uh, CMU uh, MK2+, Plus, which is the uh, communication management unit, which is required for uh, the FANS 1A and ATNB. Uh, and the new MK2 Plus, uh, while offering oceanic FANS capability, uh, like the previous version, which was the MK3, it will also offer uh, domestic FANS capability. It's uh, VDL M2 uh, multi frequency capable, um, and it's capable of the ATN uh, B1 in Europe. Um, Previously, uh, all of our legacy aircraft were whitelisted. Uh, in other words, there was a waiver. They did not have to have ATNB uh, in Europe, but we felt uh, that we were going to, regardless, equip our aircraft uh, with the AT ATN uh, B1 uh, because when you're flying over the European subcontinent, uh, they are going to give priority routing to aircraft uh, that are best equipped with the ATN. Uh, and <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, the, uh, the FANS uh, and the ATN B1 uh, compromise uh, CPDLC, which allows for uh, en route communication uh, electronically through the FMS uh, versus uh, using uh, voice, uh, getting voice uh, um, commands from uh, air traffic control. Uh, there was too much uh, saturation uh, over the airways, which created the demand for uh, CPDLC or electronic communication with the aircraft. And then the ProLine 21 uh, was our cockpit uh, solution uh, for the Falcon 2000 EX and Falcon 50 EX. Uh, both the 2000 EX and 50 EX um, were uh, outfitted with uh, ProLine Pro Line 4, uh, and the ProLine 21 uh, was the uh, next, next generation solution uh, for that ProLine 4 system. 
And uh, what the ProLine 20 did, one did for the 2000 was similar to what the Elite and Select 2 did for the Falcon 900. Uh, it improved uh, the cockpit displays to LCD uh, technology that you can see here in the picture uh, below. Uh, increased the display reliability, newer electronics, uh, provided for uh, electronic charts and maps uh, like the Elite 2 and Select 3. Uh, it also gives video display capability on the multifunction display, as well as LPV capability. Uh, it also allowed for future growth, uh, like the Select 2 and 3, for synthetic vision and uh, FANS 1A, as well as uh, multi-scan radar. Another safety feature uh, that we are uh, recommending um, operators put in their aircraft uh, is the uh, enhanced ground proximity warning system with smart runway and smart, uh, smart landing. And what the smart runway and smart landing uh, system does is it provides a role warning uh, to crew members uh, if they're approaching a runway, uh, if they're landing on a taxiway, if they're landing on the wrong runway, uh, or if they're in a long, uh, long landing situation. Uh, it, it reduces the risk of uh, runway incursions and excursions, uh, which is a primary cause for uh, many, many aviation accidents. It is also on the NTSB's most wanted list, uh, and it's one of the MBAA's uh, top safety focus area. Uh, improves airport surface and landing safety and reduces the pilot workload by with those auroral uh, warnings. And as you can see, we've made this uh, available uh, on our Falcon 2000, 2000 EX, 50 EX, 900 ABC and EX models. Uh, the MEGIT uh, ISFD, and ISFD stands for Integrated Secondary Flight Display, uh, is another uh, offering that we have uh, based on some obsolescence and reliability issues uh, of previous uh, standby indicators we had installed in the Falcon 2000, 2000 EX, 50 EX, uh, 900 EX Easy LX, and Falcon 2000 EX Easy LX and LX SNS. Uh, <clears throat> primary features of this new piece of equipment is uh, the biggest thing is it takes the existing three electromechanical uh, standby indicators, so attitude, airspeed, uh, and uh, altitude, and uh, puts it all into uh, one unit. Uh, big safety enhancement. Uh, it has much greater reliability than the previous uh, indicators uh, with a mean time between failure of 12,000 hours. Uh, provides <clears throat> attitude, altitude, airspeed, uh, and the biggest uh, add-on uh, from the previous is it has uh, ILS tracking and magnetic heading. Um, so if you lose uh, all of your primary flight displays, uh, you could pretty much land the airplane with, with this one indicator. Um, it's all solid state and has high, high resolution uh, LCD display with uh, LED backlighting, which greatly improves uh, crew, uh, crew resource management. Uh, and it has different formats to match uh, the primary flight displays. Uh, and because it's a newer piece of technology, it's got lower, lower uh, weight, uh, lower power consumption and passive cooling, which all adds up to uh, lower, uh, lower maintenance costs. And then similar to the uh, previous aircraft mentioned, uh, this is a similar piece of equipment offered uh, for the 900 uh, A, B, C, and E, X uh, that <clears throat> integrated uh, secondary flight display that replaces the existing uh, three standby indicators all in uh, one unit, um, provides attitude, altitude, airspeed. Uh, this, this particular one provides slip and vertical trend 
indication uh, for the 900 model. Uh, extremely lightweight, smooth, high definition graphics and simple user interface. It also has a very uh, small footprint, which frees up uh, a lot of um, instrument uh, uh, panel space. And then last but not least, uh, we have a new um, next generation radar that we're uh, outfitting in our 900 A, B, C, and EX uh, models. Uh, currently we have it certified uh, <clears throat> on the 900 C and EX. Uh, we're in the process of looking for a certification aircraft uh, for the 900 A and B. Uh, this is the next generation of Honeywell uh, radar. Um, and uh, one of the increased, uh, one of the many increased uh, safety features is uh, reduced pilot workload in that uh, it has automatic uh, control of the uh, tilt of the actual uh, radar antenna. Uh, provides three dimensional volumetric memory. Uh, the entire area of the front of the aircraft is automatically scanned. It's got a much, much greater uh, field of view than previous radar uh, and all the all the information, uh, weather information is stored and continuously updated. In addition, it corrects for uh, curvature uh, of the earth with previous, uh, what previous generations of the radar did not do. Um, it's got more sensitive weather detection for more accurate weather depiction. It improves the long range uh, performance of the radar and it also provides a 3D scanning uh, 3D scanning detects more weather uh, closer to the aircraft as opposed to uh, other weather systems. And uh, the main uh, features, uh, main improved safety features of this particular radar is the predictive wind shear, predictive lightning and hail, and the extended uh, range of the turbulence detection. Uh, vertical display and the uh, rain echo attenuation compensation technique. And that concludes uh, my presentation. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it and I hope everybody got uh, something out of it. And uh, I wish you all a good day and uh, happy new year. Thank you. <laughs>